Critical race theory began to develop around the 1970s. We have the main activists such as Derrick Bell, Alan Friedman and Richard Delgado. What they realised was, although things like affirmative action came about during the 1960s and also some civil rights acts during the same period and the race issue hadn't gone away and there were still issues around race which were not changing as quickly as they, as they would have liked to see. So they began to develop theories to examine race and particularly looking at the, the um, legal system in the US to develop ways of finding solutions to the problem that still exists or still existed at the time. Well, it still exists now, but they were looking at, at it back in the 1970s. So the early focus of CRT was on the legal system in the US and the laws which affected the lives of um, people of colour particularly black people. And even though these laws had gone away, the effects of these laws were still felt in the com black communities at the time, and even today. But it broadened out into looking at politics and race, even the education system and race. So now critical race theory covers a broader number of subject areas, I should say. It was influenced by earlier studies such as critical legal studies, which is looking at the legal system and society as a whole, but CRT began to focus more directly on race. Also, ideas from black, the Black Power Movement and Pan-Africanist -Afri Pan scholars such as W.E. Du Bois and Sojourner Truth. So let's look at the ba five basic tenets or principles of um, critical race theory. As I mentioned before, the groups, what they call him the intellectual father of, of CRT, Dr. Professor Derek Bell, there were other figures such as Kimberly Crenshaw, Ma Mari Matsuda, Patricia Williams, and Richard Delgado. But there are a number of other scholars that uh, were researchers, you could say, into um, critical race theory. So the first tenet of critical race theory is that racism is ordinary, uncommon. This is basically means that, as any African-American person knows, or black person knows in the West, that racism is an ordinary feature of life, even though you may not experience it every day, but in certain situations you will experience it. An example of this, Professor Williams, Patricia Williams, and she's an early proponent of CRT. She describes a situation in which she wrote an article for a newspaper and the editor eliminated or deleted the fact that she was an African-American. So the article went like this. It's about a woman, uh, her herself, she went into a shop or she was about to enter a shop. And as she was about to enter the shop, the shop attendant told her that the shop is closed, the shop is now closed. But as she looked inside the shop, she could see some white people in there still shopping. So to her, well, obviously the, the, there was an issue of race here because she was a black woman. They didn't want her to enter the, enter the shop, so they should said that they're now closed. Yeah, this was early afternoon. But the editor of the article in which in the publication that she published the article in, removed the fact that she was a black woman. So if you remove that factor, it, you would have a distorted um, view of the article in that you may just think that the shop was closing early and the people that were still in the shop were about to leave. Because you, miss it, you leave out the racial issue, you get a distorted interpretation of the article, what the article was trying to say. So that's uh, an example of race being ordinary and common. The second um, tenet is interest, interest convergence, when the interests of white elites in particular align with the black majority or the black community in terms of dealing with the race issue, then it's only aligns really when it's going to serve some interest for the white community. The white elites will say, let's have a look at the white business world, for example. Um, a few years ago, we had the George Floyd situation. And white companies at the time, because race was a major issue in the news, white companies at the time could only benefit from criticizing racial prejudice in, in the US. If there were a company that had certain racial, racist practices, they would have all certain activities within their own companies, companies which were seemed, deemed to be racist. It would be in their benefit to criticize those activities at a time where the, the general trend was to criticize race. So in that sense, they were just, they were seeing the situation as somewhere that, something that they could benefit from by engaging 
with the same um, line of thinking as the anti-racists. Otherwise, they may not have um, looked at their own companies and the, looking at some of the activities that their companies were practicing in terms of race. Um, tenant number three, race is a social construct. This one is based on the exact idea that um, ideas around race are socially constructed. For example, in the 18th century, century, you had the Dred Scott v. Sanford court case in which Dred Scott sued the executor of the estate where he was once a slave to be acknowledged as a citizen. He lost the case at the time, but later on he was granted. So basically, it's, what it's saying is that blacks, free or enslaved, were not citizens of the U.S., because of a particular law at the time. Also, an example of this is in 1935, non-minorities were denied a social security and excluded from unions. So blacks and other minorities were excluded from certain social institutions because of race. They were deemed not viable to be accepted in these institutions. So that's, that's a form of a, what you might call constructing race, looking at race in a particular way. Or the most commonly one known amongst African Americans would be blacks, Africans being seen as three fifths of a man, which was part of the US thought at one time. And number four, storytelling and counter storytelling. These are basically narrative. The narrative of white superiority is a, is a story. And the counter story to this would be the African story, the African perspective of things where you create your, your own narrative and history of yourselves and you put it out in, into the public to counter the negative, what you might call, stereotypes of African people. And then number five, whites are the recipients of civil rights le legislation. The most, best example of this is the affirmative action. Affirmative action was created to increase the number of minorities in white-dominated institutions such as universities. So if the population of a district is... 10% African Americans, then university, a university in that, in that district would also have to have a 10% population of African Americans. So it, it was meant to bolster the number of African Americans in certain institutions or to help the increase in the number of minorities in certain institutions. How this would benefit whites or allow whites to be recipients of, of civil rights legislation is that this same institution that allows 10% of African Americans need not, need not go beyond that 10%. So if you're an institution and you didn't want too many blacks to be in, in that institution, you'd stick to the quotas, as you might call them, of how many ethnic minorities or black people are supposed to be in that institution. So in that way, your institution would benefit in that you would no need to go past the quotas that, uh, or the state quotas or district quotas that were set in place for your district. So you'd benefit in a sense by restricting the number of blacks by sticking to the particular quota. So those are the five tenets of uh, critical race theory.